Hello, Working Preachers. This is Joy J. Moore. Our fall campaign is in full swing, but we still need your help to reach our goal before November 30th. We're celebrating Working Preacher as a community of imagination this week. I'm grateful for writers, actors, musicians, and well, those people who allow me to pretend that I am one of those persons. I've appreciated the patterns of being able to be creative, whether trying to repeat what I've seen in art or trying to describe with words the awesomeness of what it means to experience God and put it in words. Those people in my life are the kinds of people that make me the preacher I am. You can make your gift to the fall campaign in honor or memory of someone who supports you in your faith journey. I can't wait to see who you honor with your generosity to Working Preacher. And thank you to every one of you who have given so generously already. You can go to workingpreacher.org today to make your gift. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for this week, um, which are the texts for Christ the King Sunday, which falls on November 26, 2023. Um, our first reading is from Ezekiel 34, verses 11 through 16 and verse 20 through 24. Our psalm is the 95th Psalm, verses 1 through 7a. The second reading is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And we continue in the Gospel of Matthew uh, chapter 25, reading verses 31 through 36. Uh, so uh, we are uh, on the reign of Christ Sunday. And thus endeth the year of Matthew. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's... Uh... So we made it, everybody. Preachers made it through Matthew. And on you're mark. a. You're a. On to Mark. Uh, the best name of the Gospels. I know. The uh, the origin, you know, a lot of people don't like the reign of Christ or Christ of King Sunday for a lot of reasons. We're not too good with kings in this part of the world. But uh, I like the fact that it was a feast or a celebration that was created I think either just before or just after World War I as, a, as an answer back to nationalism, mm. as a way for the church to take a stand against that. I'm not sure this is how I would have taken the stand against nationalism today, <laughs> but it's worth talking about how does, how does Jesus fit our understandings of who's in control, who gets allegiance, and what does it mean to be a citizen and a Christian. I'm not so sure Matthew 25 helps us with that directly. I think it was chosen just because it's got a king in it. That <laughs> um, well, yes. maybe there's some. Um, um, th there is still some working of the Holy Spirit in the choosing of text, because um, what it looks like here to be a part of that kingdom is what we've been talking about these last few weeks, and that is living. It, as the embodied demonstration of the grace of God. And the yeah. judgment that comes here is for those who have actually extended mercy and made life um, less oppressive for others versus those who have been, um, who have participated in oppressing others and ignored those who are in suffering. So whether they meant to or not, it is a powerful text um, to, uh, to speak to us today uh, behind the readings that we've had these last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think too, it, it really does pull together. I, I mean, I was kind of joking about ending, you know, thus endeth the year of Matthew, but I mean, I actually really mean that I have some intention around that in how is it that coming to the end of our traveling through this gospel how is it that in this passage we're we're also uh, being called back to some of the main themes of this gospel and 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 things that we've been talking about for you know for this past year? So 
you know, verse 34, um, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I mean, that that should take you back again to the Beatitudes, that, that blessed and you've inherited this kingdom and what now are you going to do with it? Of and then you you know you go on through the rest of the sermon on the mount so taking people back uh taking people back to that i uh, i think too verse 44 lord when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you the verb there actually is and we did not serve you and so that that takes us back to uh, chapter 20 uh, where you have uh, you have it will not be a so among you the tyrants over you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we have that that this is what service looks like, uh, and again a manifestation of of the kingdom present, but also that responsibility and that obedience that we have been entrusted with this kingdom. And again, reminding reminding ourselves that this is on the cusp of, of Jesus' arrest. And we have that, that responsibility. So uh, bringing all of those themes or so many of those themes that we've experienced in Matthew that you hear here in this passage, I think is really key. Yeah, if we're going to give Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes pride of place as the first public statement in his ministry, this one also gets it because this is the last public statement, so to speak, prior to his uh, his, his last meal. And so yeah. that makes it significant. And it's also, I think, a parable that helps us put the previous two parables into context, where it's easy to come out of those and say, wow, this guy's really harsh. Um, there's harshness in this too, but the people he's talking about here, like before he was addressing his disciples, here he's talking about the nations, like all the nations will be assembled before him, all the ethne in Greek. Mm -hmm. And I think the assumption here is these are, from Matthew's perspective, like everybody, everybody in the far flung reaches of the globe. They didn't know there was a globe then, but you know, of the planet, didn't know there was a planet then, of creation, uh, all being assembled before this king. And some are, well, all of them are like, what are you talking about? because they didn't realize, realize what they were doing. And so the message here is that Christ is encountered by people utterly separate of doctrine or insight or wisdom, but in, in these simple acts of mercy, there's something sacramental. So what kind of king is this? He's a judge, yes, but he's also this accessible king who resides literally in flesh in the suffering, in the hungry, in the imprisoned, in the those who aren't clothed. So that's that's huge in terms of an understanding of can you trust this Messiah? Mm -hmm. Which after yeah. the last two weeks you might be a little worried. And now here's I think a statement yeah. of you wouldn't believe how accessible this Jesus is through the acts of mercy to anybody. And it it is you talk about how it, it circles the 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 book of Matthew, you know, coming up in terms of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Um, before we get to Matthew 5, we have Jesus actually doing the things that he is asking for in Matthew 25. Yeah, yeah the, the acts of mercy and healing. Yeah, uh -huh. and he's already got a huge following even in Matthew because yeah. Because of his acts, not of his words. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think there's something too that the preacher would want to pay attention to in that verse 31, you know, when the, uh, the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And then after this, this section is over in verse 46, uh, you have verse, you have chapter 26, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, which is a lot of things. things. <laughs> Jesus, when Jesus said, and he, so, and, and just to remember that, that, you know, there weren't any chapters or verses. So it, 
Jesus says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, and then you can just, you know, that's again, a lot of things. He said to the disciples, you know, that after two days, the Passover coming and the son of man will be handed over to be crucified. So I think that's another important contextual element here of how verse 31 and 26, one bracket, all of this, that, you know, the son of man will come in his glory and that glory is now going to be, uh, to be the crucified one. And, uh, and how does that, how does that then that bracketing also shape, uh, how we hear, uh, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was hungry and you, and, and then, um, and yet, you know, this is what empire will do to, um, those acts of mercy. Hmm. Uh, Ezekiel. Ezekiel is that, um, uh, is an old Testament idea of who's sitting on the throne. Um, uh, I, I was, I, I, was thinking, wow, this is probably where we should shift to Ezekiel, as you were describing um, uh, Jesus taking uh, taking his position on the throne. Um, but in the midst of this, uh, we have that same sense of remembering that a- a- as this prophet is speaking, um, the people of God have experienced oppression. And I, I know I keep saying that, but this has been a difficult time for them. And so these words are very similar of, of, of the perpetuation of what you've described, Matt. Um, God has punished. God has um, um, uh, held them accountable for their failure to be a blessing to others, uh, for their failure to obey. And and here the prophet says that God, God's self will search for God's sheep and will seek them out and using an image that for them would be very familiar to say that like a shepherd, mm-hmm. uh, that God will find them, protect them, uh, uh, set up a leadership, uh, 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 set, set, set up protection over them and uh, keep the promises that were made um, to Abraham and Sarah, the descendants, and particularly to David. Yeah. Yeah, again, all that I will language. I, mm-hmm. I will seek out. I will rescue. I'll bring them out. I'll bring them into their own land. I will feed them. Uh, I'll, I'll bring back the strayed, bind up the injured, strengthen the weak, all of these. Mm-hmm. This yeah. language of promise. Uh, and the commentary is helpful in terms of don't miss the first 10 verses of this passage that Mm -hmm. talk about, like you're saying, Joy, that the people need a shepherd because the ones they had were doing it. So God then steps into that role. Yeah. And then that's, of course, the, that's how that image of, you know, the Lord as the good shepherd uh, is such an important how this passage is such an important imagination for what what does good leadership look like uh, and and how does that how does that get described and imagined in the in the biblical witness i think the other thing that kind of summarizes really uh the matthew passage is i will feed them with justice you know i mean just just to play with that metaphor uh that 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 all of what that Matthew passage is is about just justice and mercy, and uh, and so when you're fed with that, then that that becomes what you do. I just I think I would do something with that because I just find that so so profound um, to think Matt, that God does. Yeah, Matt, I appreciate that bit of history that you set it in in terms of how the lectionary came up with Christ the King. I did not know that. Um, but uh, knowing that and then having this text uh, in terms of, as you said, Caroline, what does leadership look like? Um, because, again, setting this in the larger context of Israel, uh, Israel asked for a king. Why? So that they could be like all the other nations. And when they became like the other nations, God judged them as God had judged the other nations. And yet God never gave up on what God said God will do. And that is not just for Israel, 
But through Israel for all the world, God will remove oppression. God will remove suffering. And it's not uh, a authoritative leader of a king, but it is the caring, attentive, I will follow away these crazy sheep wherever they wander, shepherd. That is such a powerfully different image of what it means to serve. Yeah. And that's where I would bring I would bring in the psalm because that 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 irony almost right that you were just talking about joy of the way in which the psalmist the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods and then for He is our God and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand and so you have this like you know great God and then. And that we are, you know, we are in the hands of the shepherd. We are the sheep in the hands of the shepherd, which is such an interesting juxta juxtaposition. The other thing I would do with this psalm is have it be like used in the worship service somehow. I mean, so I always say that liturgically, but like, but, uh, but maybe as a, like a response to the psalm or like a, I mean, as, sorry, a response to the sermon or or even the confession for that day of how is it that we're we're confessing out loud in response to the other realities of the gods in whom people believe that our God is our, you know, our God reigns. Right? Mm hmm Yeah. Ephesians? Are we Anything else with the psalm? Ephesians? we we'll go to Ephesians. Uh, I love how um, um, the comment commentary talks about um, moving from the particular uh, or, the, or the local to the larger uh, uh, context. Uh, in reading uh, Ephesians uh, or preaching Ephesians so that it is not just directed at uh, the individual or even our individual con congregation. But as we've been talking about all of these weeks, uh, how these works matter for the larger community that the people of God are to be the light in the world for. Yeah, the notion of power and dominion there in verses 20 through 23, and the um, which always needs to be qualified, like what kind of power are we talking about? What kind of dominion are we talking about? What does this mean for the rulers of this age? And to do this in a way that's responsible. And by responsible, I don't mean necessarily safe, but just, I think I mean not stupid. Um, <laughs> in a way that doesn't say that power and dominion is now ours to exercise over everybody else. And, you know, you have to talk about what is what is God's glorious inheritance and how does this matter for us? And so just to, I think, frame some of the issues. I I didn't hear people talking about, at least in the churches in America that I find myself in, I didn't hear people talking about white Christian nationalism 10 years ago. At least people kind of know what it is or they think they know what it is. And just to talk about the way in which the Bible itself might have some temptations Mm. toward a church that thinks its calling is dominion mm -hmm. uh, over the world and the world's political systems. And just to acknowledge it's there, but then also to start to ask, what are the other options? And how does, and just to raise the question, to get people talking, right? How do you understand the church's public witness in the world? Uh, what does it mean for the church to include politicians, whether those are local or, or, you know, more regional and how do we support people in those callings, but also to always hold Christ up as king or when the one who reigns or whatever, whatever that means for us. Because I think people have ideas about that and they sure know, most of them know what they don't want. <laughs> they know yeah. what's dangerous. Yeah. But I, th and I think too, one of the important phrases in this passage is that qualifier, what, uh, the, the qualification of what that power is that God put this power. So you have, you know, you have uh, what's come before in terms of the riches of his glorious inheritance among the same, and what is the measurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power, 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 power. And then God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead. 
and then, you know, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. But when he raised him from the dead. So how is it that a, a preacher might enter into that to say that that power power comes from or the the way the way that God put God's power to work is raising Christ from raising the dead. I uh, and and giving life, giving new life that power is behold it is is beheld in resurrection and so that as a qualifier for power god's power i think could be a really powerful <laughs> sermon oh. <laughs>